Welcome back to the class. And um, uh, as you know, we are into the eighth week of this um, lecture series. We are looking into subaltern studies um, as a very important uh, uh, theoretical intervention, theoretical as well as methodological intervention uh, into the whole debate about historiography or the questions about studying Indian history. And um, I mentioned in the previous class that uh, subaltern studies is not a strict sociological uh, you know methodological framework rather it's a it was a very important decisive intervention in the debates about historiography but uh, as you know the subaltern studies framework the way the kind of questions it raised the kind of methodological <coughs> interventions that it uh, you know it it, it uh, propagated and uh, the kind of an ideological critique that it uh, presented to the conventional ways in which uh, knowledge was produced recorded and disseminated uh, they have much long ranging influences on other social science disciplines including sociology, anthropology, women's studies, literature and, and other things. So that is the reason why uh, it is pertinent for us to uh, look at uh, subaltern studies as a very important uh, you know uh, intervention, theoretical intervention and that too uh, you know uh, contributed or, or developed mostly by Indian scholars and which uh, also emerges as a very uh, strong critique of the Eurocentric uh, understandings of um, history, historiography and other things. So, in the previous uh, class, we had a very detailed look at uh, Deepesh Chakravarti's essay that kind of uh, summarizes the subaltern studies intervention and how try to connect it with how it was a uh, project closely connected with uh, the uh, post-coloniality, post-colonial uh, you know interventions. So, in this study, in, in this today's class, we are looking at yet another essay, an essay written in 1994 by Gyan Prakash titled Subaltern Studies as Post-Colonial Criticism. And um, so, I am not using the essay, rather I am using excerpts from that essay in the form of PowerPoint, so that it becomes um, much more uh, you know, easier to manage. So, uh, to note the ferment created by subaltern studies in disciplines as diverse as history, anthropology and literature is to recognize the force of recent post-colonial criticism. So, uh, you know that as I mentioned several times, subaltern studies emerged in the 1980s as a very important uh, uh, intellectual intervention, started with uh, Ranjit Guha's very, very, very uh, important book on peasant insurgency. Then they started uh, uh, the subaltern studies edited volume, uh, he, Ranjit Guha and, uh, uh, and four or five of his uh, students and then uh, it went up to 12 volumes. So, uh, and, and the last published volume was in, nine, uh, in 2005. So, over these years, uh, it actually uh, you know emerged as a very formidable set of intellectual project and uh, it the kind of ferment it created uh, in other disciplines as well as we mentioned in history, definitely anthropology and literature is to recognize the force of recent post-colonial criticism. So, why that it, it acts, this whole project accepted so much of, of uh, relevance was because it was seen as a very important uh, you know intervention in the post-colonial criticism. So, post-colonial criticism means the way in which uh, scholars try to revisit uh, the implications and influences of colonialism on the knowledge production and its presentation. Okay, because you are now in sitting in 2023 or in or 1990s or 2000, when you look at how what has been the way in which Indian society underwent change during colonial period or even in the post-colonial period, we realize that our access to the colonial experience is heavily mediated by the colonial intervention, the colonial project of modernity, the colonialism as a as a governmental project, colonialism as a as, as a as a uh, you know project from the from from the European uh, you know. Uh, part of the world. So, you understand that without uh, having a very uh, you know incisive, incisive criticism of the whole colonial project, you will not even have a better access to the various or multiple realities of, of Indian colonial experience and as well as the post-colonial experience. So, there are increasing interest among the academic circle to look at this colonial experience and the colonial way of producing knowledge and then presenting it and articulating it uh, to, to critically look at that and then to explore well, are there various other ways in which we can uh, look at these things. As nationalism reversed Orientalist thought and attributed agency and history to the subjected nation, it staked a claim to the order of reason and progress institution instituted by colonialism. So, this is another very uh, interesting point that um, Gyan Prakash uh, talks because after uh, independence, uh, uh, the nationalism emerged as a very important project 
uh, we mentioned in the previous class the nationalist historians wanted to argue that uh, Indian people in general uh, cutting across elites and subaltern they possess certain ideological uh, you know inclination certain certain ideas about what is nationalism so that is what kind of inspired all these people to come together that is a kind of a nationalist argument and this nationalist argument uh, Gyan Prakash argues once nationalism reversed the orientalist thought and attributed agency and history to the subject nation it stake claim to uh, the order of reason and progress instituted by colonialism so this nationalist his uh, uh, claims it argued that the indian people both elite as well as the subaltern also are capable of using reason and progress and the whole colonial the whole uh, independent struggle was a, was a spectacle of uh, reason and progress okay so that is how it was actually presented when marxist turned the spotlight on colonial exploitation their criticism was framed by a historicist scheme that universalized european uh, europe's historical experience so uh, the uh, as as we know uh, scholars like bipin chandra who had a very strong marxist inclination uh, came to the uh, an, or, or 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 you know presented their historio, uh, historical intervention in the nationalist uh, garb so they also when they also presented it they could not come out of the kind of a stagist uh, you know developmental uh, discourse that we discussed uh, yesterday uh, that criticism was framed by a historicist scheme that universalized europe europe's historical experience so we mentioned that the, that uh, marxian uh, framework or marxian analysis of history always presented the uh, the called question of development in a uh, in a linear fashion as moving from different stages and uh, they presented the transformation of every society as intricately interconnected with the uh, with the evolution of capital okay so a transition from traditional society to modern society is bound uh, you know inherently with the the emergence of, of of capitalism because it also had this kind of universe and and that kind of a scheme emerges from the europe's experience which they believed is the experience for every other nation accusing colonialist nationalist and marxist interpretations of robbing the common people of their agency it announced a new approach to restore history or uh, to the subordinate so here they are talking about the subaltern <coughs> studies so what uh, subaltern studies intervention uh, made as we discussed yesterday was that it critiqued the cambridge school okay which reduced everything into colonial intervention and it it, it almost accused indian uh, you know elites for uh, yeah, for for making use of the colonial opportunities and then uh, presenting the uh, the freedom struggle and it uh, subaltern studies also critiqued nationalist projects it also critiqued uh, you know marxist uh, projects because it criticized the nationalist uh, historiography because uh, it saw that uh, a, a host of you know oppositions a host of revolts host of agitations undertaken by ordinary people okay the people who are already subordinated were not recognized by the elites or the elites had a lot of discomfort in theorizing in and accepting the agitations of the ordinary people because their language their modes of agitation did not fit into the definition of an of an agitation or consciousness or or political agency of that of the of the uh, elite uh, sections so that is why it announced a new approach to the restore history uh, to the subordinate the term subaltern drawn from antonio gramsci's writings refers to subordination in terms of class caste gender race language and culture and was used to signify the centrality of dominant dominated relationship in history so this uh, subaltern is a very broad term and uh, you can look it with respect to class questions it in encompasses questions of poverty poor then caste gender race language and culture it's it's a very very broadly and loosely defined uh, section so guha suggested that while subaltern studies would not ignore the dominant because the subaltern are always subjected to their activity its aim was to rectify the elitist bias characteristic of much research and academic work in south asian studies so the whole uh, point of uh, you know uh, entry or or point of intervention of subaltern studies is that uh, guha argued that when you study the lives of subaltern people who are subjected to exploitation maybe take the example of you know factory workers take the example of agricultural laborers take the example of you know uh, scheduled caste people who are forced to do uh, menial jobs you when you study these people okay at the same time it also becomes necessary that you study the people who subject these people to exploitation because without them okay without the people who 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 uh, subjugate them to suppression and and and, and oppressive uh, you know uh, methods 
these people simply do not have their own existence. So, Guha suggested that while subaltern studies would not ignore the dominant because subalterns are always subjected to their activity. Because the subalterns very existence, the way subaltern you know acted was heavily determined by the by the agendas or by the activities of this dominant group. So, it becomes a study of not only that of the subaltern groups but also uh, on the dominant and dominating structures. The subaltern had acted in history on their own that is independently of the elite. Their politics constituted an autonomous domain for it neither originated from the elite politics nor did its experience depend on the latter. Now, this is the very important claim made by Guha or almost every other uh, you know uh, subaltern study scholar that the subalterns okay even though they were dominated even though they were in a in a in a, in a uh, you know uh, uh, in exploited situation if you look into the history especially if you look into the period of colonialism you will come across several instances hundreds of instances where the subalterns acted on their own okay having their own agency having their own subjectivity and having that is independent of the elite their politics constituted an autonomous domain for it neither originated from the elite politics nor did it exist dependent on the later. So, this is a very very important and radical claim that the people who were already subjected, subjugated, people who were already you know, subordinated had articulated, had displayed their own agency independent of the people who you know oppressed them. And this is a very important uh, claim and also it is a very important traces, important uh, challenges in terms of how do you prove that. Okay. How do you, what are the materials that you can use to demonstrate that these people had their own independent existence. The nationalist and Marxist narratives had sought to represent the subaltern's consciousness and activity according to the schemes that encoded elite dominance. Guha asserted that historiography had dealt with the peasant rebel merely as an empirical person or a member of a class, but not as an entity whose will and reason constituted the praxis called as rebellion. So, uh, the kind of discomfort that uh, subaltern study scholars had about the Marxist and the nationalist narrative is that they tend to uh, ignore the kind of articulations from the uh, from the from the subaltern sections. Uh, for example, any uh, kind of sense of identity or, or, or sense of collectivity or sense of uh, affinity based on caste or based on gender or based on ethnicity was kind of discounted or, or they were relegated in the dominant uh, uh, argument of Marxist and nationalist or any uh, use of violence for that matter or things that are seen as irrational. Okay, There are very interesting arguments about how the in, in the Mapla rebellion of 1921, how the Mapla rebels okay, behaved in a very irrational manner, in, an, in, a, in a very rapidly communal manner according to some of the historical uh, representation. So, uh, each of these, uh, each of each of these uh, agitations were kind of a dismissed or they were relegated, they were criticized, they were overlooked by the elites because these agitations did not really fit into their description of how an agitation must be rational and, and modern uh, forms of uh, agitation. Clearly, the project to restore the insurgence agency involved, as Rosalind O. Hanlon pointed out in a thoughtfully thoughtful review essay, the notion of the recovery of the subject. Thus, while reading records against their grain, these scholars have sought to uncover the subalterns' myths, cults, ideologies and revolts that colonial and nationalist elites sought to appropriate and that conventional historiography had laid waste by the deadly weapon of cause and effect. Okay? So, now uh, we are coming back to one of these fundamental questions. See, subaltern are the people by definition did not have access to you know literature did not have access to education they were the most uh, you know uh, uh, they, they were the most exploited people so when you for a, for a for a conventional historian the most important uh, resource for you to understand the past are the recorded material okay recorded material uh, it could be there in archives it could be uh, written in papers or in or in uh, you know various other forms of inscription so written materials are the most important way to to, to retrieve the past to have a peek into the into the past and especially the colonial period the colonial government had a very systematic uh, way of recording and then record keeping and then documentation so we have enormous uh, you know information 
okay uh, in indian archives as well as archives in in, in foreign countries in in dutch you have uh, archives in in portuguese you have uh, in portugal you have ar ar archives in britain you have uh, you know enormous amount of archives <coughs> on archival material on indian society so the whole question is <coughs> now how do we uh, get access to these people who actually acted on the ground because they have not left anything in record okay they have not recorded anything the people the 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 the, the peasants who revolted in various uh, things the the laborers who revolted the mapla uh, you know uh, uh, people who participated in mapla rebellion who revolted or the people who uh, you know um, participated in, in in customs like sati these people none of them have left any records of their own okay they were always represented okay their actions were recorded they were always represented by the people who belong to the upper section the people the government officials the you know the bureaucrats the observers the people who kind of part of this dominating system so the fundamental question for uh, for uh, uh, subaltern studies is that how do we how do you retrieve recovery how do you recover the subject okay how do you recover the life of the subjects okay who did not have a chance to represent themselves but how do we how do you reach there through the uh, through by by going through the material that are presented by the people who are part of a dominating structure so while the reading records against their grain these scholars have sought to uncover the subaltern's myths okay because uh, many of these uh, uh, groups had their own mythologies okay their own stories which were kind of dismissed by the other uh, the, their, their uh, you know the superiors are superstitions and blind beliefs and, and and other things and cults and ideologies and revolts that colonial and nationalist elites sought to appropriate and that conventional historiography had laid waste by the deadly weapon of cause and effect so guha's account the subaltern uh, emerges with forms of sociality and political community at odds with the nas nation and the class defying the models of rationality and social action that conventional historiography uses so when you look into uh, the 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 actual way in which many of the subaltern groups behaved okay there are so many examples by if you if you read the first or, or two or three uh, you know volumes of uh, of of subaltern studies you come across quite a lot of very specific studies whether it is gyanendra pandey or ranjit guha himself or a host of other people they have very elaborate accounts about how the subalterns behaved or they acted in specific accounts on specific instances whether it is a host of uh, chauri chaura incident or, or or the you know jute uh, workers uh, agitation in calcutta or a, or or even this mapla rebellion there there are so many uh, instances where the work the the subaltern acted uh, uh, in in ways that were not seen as rational or logical by the by the upper class uh, people so which did not really fit into the modalities of nation and the class defying the models of rationality and social action that conventional historiography uses guha argues persuasively that such models are elitist in so far as they deny the subaltern sub autonomous consciousness and that they are drawn from colonial and liberal nationalist project of appropriating the subaltern so uh, this kind of particular way of appropriating subaltern by overlooking their own uh, uh, their own acts of articulating their own self their own identity uh guha argues it's a part of the nationalist project okay it's a part of a nationalist project it was also uh, heavily influenced by the marxian uh, you know the, the 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 issues within marxian historiography although the, some scholars have rejected the positivistic retrieval of the subaltern the notion of the subaltern's radical heterogeneity with uh, through though not not autonomy from the dominant remain crucial so the whole there are, you know this is the fundamental question can you uh um, you know get past okay the mediation of the oppressed group the the uh, the oppressive group and then get a direct access to the people can you have an unmediated access to the subaltern themselves okay so can you uh, say that okay this is what the subalterns uh, are or this is what they said or this is what they wanted is that a kind of a positivist uh, argument that okay this is the objective reality about subaltern is it possible is a very very fundamental question okay can you can you hear the subaltern speak the gayatri chakravarti speak works very very influentially say can the subaltern speak it it comes from such kind of a questions because there are no subalterns who have articulated their own uh, you know uh, sense they were always represented by others okay they were always represented by others and so that a a, a how do you navigate through the kind of materials that that claim to represent these people 
okay you have no way to understand how the what were the kind of a ideas and the thinking process of the people who attacked chauri chaura uh, police station okay you have no way to understand the jute workers mind in 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 calcutta or in or in different other place or in the people who uh, engaged in communal clashes or the people who engaged in the kind of mapla rebellion okay there is nothing is written of their own okay and they were always represented recorded and then explained justified theorized by uh, the colonial uh, administrators or indian elites so although some scholars have rejected the positivist tick retrieval of subalterns the notion of subalterns radical heterogeneity within though not autonomy from the dominant remain the crucial so the the claim that they have certain kind of uh, radical heterogeneities there and and it may not be complete autonomy from the dominant so that part remained crucial it is true however that scholars locate this heterogeneity in discourses woven into the fabric of dominant structures and manifesting itself in the very operation of power so how these uh, you know heterogeneity how their ideas were represented is also the story of power okay how the power uh, of the dominating structures like uh, bureaucrats and then british government officials or the scholars or the experts how they used their power okay in the form of knowledge to present certain kind of depictions certain kind of explanations certain kind of theorizations of these people's actions in other words subaltern and subalternity do not disappear into discourse but appear in it interstices subordinated by structures over which they exert pressure so so that is a whole um, argument that you uh, the, the 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 subaltern a positivist uh, Uh, you know retrieval or recovery of the subaltern is not possible because they simply are not there but at the same time guha argued that by very uh, ingenious use of these materials okay the way in which they uh, were represented the colonial records you get certain glimpses okay you certain certain glimpses you certain uh, certain 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 flashes about how the subaltern uh, behaved or how the subaltern kind of expressed themselves such re examinations of south asian history do not invoke real subaltern okay prior to discourse in framing their critic placing subalterns in the labyrinth of discourse they cannot claim an unmediated access to their reality so these subalterns they were always created through the discourse made by the uh, colonial enterprise okay because they were already part of a discourse now can uh, as i have been uh, you know telling repeatedly can you have a direct access to the subalterns without the mediation of the discourse because they are already always a part of a discourse they were a part of a discourse because they were already recorded their actions were recorded their actions were commented upon it was theorized by the uh, people who were in power okay for example if there is a, a communal riot takes place between two different caste groups okay one caste is identified as a hindu the other caste is identified as as a muslim and if there is a violent clash happens because of various reasons okay it was presented in the british uh, uh, records as a kind of a communal clash okay so the british would a uh, british discourse would present this clash between two lower caste people as a communal clash as the religion being the sole reason for it religion being the sole cause for it okay and the cause for such a clash could be multiple religious identity could be one uh, contestations and competition for materials could be different uh, there could be a host of other reasons okay there could be a host of other factors that might have given birth to such kind of a clash but this in in the in the in the british uh, narrative in the british discourse it is already it has already become a part of a discourse so the question is can you access these people okay without uh, without uh, taking the help of a discourse or can you can you get access to the uh, to the to the to the subalterns beyond the discourse or before the discourse or prior to the discourse placing subalterns in the labyrinth of discourse they cannot claim an unmediated access to their reality the actual subaltern and subalternity emerges between the folds of this discourse in its sali- uh, silences and blindness and its over determined pronouncement so the way you understand these people it uh, it requires you to very critically look at the at the discourse that is created okay because the discourse you you no longer look at it as an objective depiction of of fact and and by 1980s uh, 90s as i mentioned the works of foucault for works of edward said and works of uh, antonio gramsci had become very very influential so they knew that how knowledge is produced 
okay, how archives work, how records are maintained, how reports are uh, written in, in the colonial period. So, uh, they understood it as, as, as a, as a uh, you know, discourse, the colonial discourse about, about the way in which they understand Indian society. So, the claim or the challenge is how do you uh, critically evaluate the discourse and then try to understand the people which, uh, is, uh, which are depicted, who are depicted in that discourse. Subalternity this emerges in the paradoxes of the functioning of power, in the functioning of the dominant discourse as it represents and domesticates peasant agency as a spontaneous and pre-political response to the colonial violence. No longer does it appear outside the elite discourse as a separate domain, embodied in a figure endowed with a will that the dominant suppresses and overpower but do not constitute. Instead, it refers to that impossible thought, figure or action without which the dominant discourse cannot exist and which is acknowledged in its uh, subvertage and stereotypes. So, this is uh, uh, a, a paragraph about uh, Ranjit Guha's own uh, you know, arguments about this peasant uh, insurgency. Uh, he he uh, examines around 100, more than 100 peasant insurgencies and then uh, comes to the argument uh, that uh, that any attempt to recover the subject has to undergo this kind of a complex negotiations with the dominant discourses that are presented. The subaltern studies relocation of subalternity in the operation of dominant discourse leads it necessarily to the critique of the modern West. For if the marginalization of the other source of knowledge and agency occurred in the function of colonialism and its derivative nationalism, then the weapon of critique must turn against Europe and the modes of knowledge it instituted. It is in this context that there, are, there emerges certain convergence between subaltern studies and post-colonial critique originating in the literary and cultural studies. So here, again, Prakash, uh, you know, uh, takes his whole uh, argument back to uh, the one of the another, uh, you know, implications of subaltern studies. Because subaltern studies, while it wanted to understand Indian society more, uh, more, more closely uh, by trying to understand how the subalterns actually lived, but it also entailed a larger critique of the uh, historical dominance that the West had, uh, not only over the polity and economy of India or uh, you know colonies at large but if on the knowledge production itself okay because uh, uh, the the western domination over india was not only a domination over the economic or political domains of the country but it was also over the or the production of knowledge okay modern social sciences whether history or or, or economics or sociology or anthropology they were all, all originated in the west and they were imported in India, they were they were brought to India and then presented as very capable frameworks to understand that. Okay? And they were all Eurocentric to a large extent. They were all ethnocentric to a large extent, they were all Eurocentric to a large extent. So, it became, so the, the subaltern studies also uh, became a part of a larger uh, critique of post-colonial studies. And this post-colonial studies mostly emerged from culture studies and liter literature, uh, you know, English literature. So, there was a major, uh, you know, alignment between these two. Because uh, uh, how, uh, as I mentioned, how uh, Indian society was depicted, okay, the, the whole uh, colonial uh, archives uh, were a very specific manifestation of power relations. Okay, uh, how uh, a particular incident was recorded uh, by uh, you know British bureaucrats, how it was uh, codified, how it was compiled into report, how it was commented upon, how it and later how the British uh, or colonial scholars theorized that. All these things are part of a larger colonial project, okay, which which had uh, which was very intricately connected with the questions of power and domination. The dominance of Europe as history not only subalternizes non-Western societies, but also serves the aim of their nation state. The inescapable conclusion from such analysis is that history authorized by the European imperialism and the Indian nation state functions as a discipline, empowering certain forms of knowledge while disempowering others. So, here this discipline is uh, has to be understood uh, in the Foucauldian uh, sense. So, uh, the dominance of Europe also and which was also kind of imitated uh, uh, or, or kind of replicated uh, in the form of nation state, the similar arguments, similar logic was uh, replicated that. The inescapable conclusion from such analysis is that history authorized by European imperialism and the Indian nation state function as a discipline, okay, which is capable of disciplining other forms of alternative forms of knowledge, empowering certain forms of knowledge while disempowering others. 
So, uh, this uh, as I mentioned, this raises larger questions about epistemology, larger questions about uh, you know uh, theoretical orientation, about methodology, how certain forms of knowledge are seen as official, how certain forms of knowledge are seen as objective, real, authentic, while certain other forms of knowledge were seen as uh, as 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 uh, you know de, uh, as as not having any of these features. It is important to note that Europe or the West in subaltern studies refers to an imaginary uh, through powerful entity created by historical process that authorized it as the home of reason, progress, and modernity. We are all, you know, familiar with that story. How uh, you know enlightenment was connected with Europe, and how Europe was seen as the founding head of all modern enlightenment and 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 rationality and other things. To undo the authority of such an entity, distributed and universalized by imperialism and nationalism, requires, in uh, Chakrabarti's words, the provincialization of. Europe. So, uh, Dibesh Chakravarti is very, very influential essay on, on uh, you know, provincializing Europe to, to look at, to more critically look at the, the, the historic configuration of Europe. It, it requires a much larger project. But uh, uh, the recognition that the third world historian is condemned uh, to knowing Europe as the original form of modern, whereas the European historian does not share a comparable predicament with regard to the parts of the majority of the humankind, serves as the condition for a deconstructive rethinking of history. So, how do you provincialize Europe? How do you, you know, how do you uh, significantly undermine this Eurocentrism? Okay, or how do you uh, intellectually and politically undermine the authority of Europe? Uh, there are no 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 specific answers. Okay, uh, again, Prakash says that uh, sense of nativism that uh, we will use only the concepts that are emerged from within. They are all unsustainable. Okay, they are all unsustainable. They are all uh, not come to uh, you know uh, relevance. And also the uh, political and economic dominance of Europe uh, in uh, in particular and maybe the West in general uh, uh, in, in, in it remains almost uncontested even now. They, they continue to be the fountain head, they continue to be the most important place of knowledge production, they have the best of the universities, uh, you know, every other world looks upon them uh, for, uh, for, for guidance and for uh, academic uh, quality and, and other things. So, in such a situation, uh, what is left or what uh, a possibility is to, uh, is to subject this history itself uh, into a kind of a deconstructive thinking and, and deconstruction as you know. Uh, is, a, is, is a very important methodological uh, tool popularized by, uh, you know, uh, Derrida. Uh, so, so, there is a turn in, in that into deconstruction with uh, Gayatri, Chakravarti, Spivak and, and, and others. So, subaltern studies have, uh, uh, has arrived at its critique by engaging both Marxism and post-structuralism. But the nature of these engagements is complex. If the influence of Gramscian Marxism is palpable in the concept of subaltern and the treatment of such themes as hegemony and dominance, Marxism is also subjected to the post-structuralist critique of European humanism. So, uh, it is a concluding uh, part where Gyan Prakash kind of looks at uh, uh, the historical evolution of, of uh, subaltern studies and how various ideologies were, you know, interrogated and remolded and then selectively engaged uh, by subaltern studies group. Representing a negotiation between South Asian historiography and the discipline of history centered in the West, its insights can be neither limited to South Asia nor globalized. Trafficking between the two and originating as an ambivalent colonial aftermath, subaltern studies demand that its own translation also occurs between these lines. So, uh, uh, the South Asia, uh, you know, it occupies a very, very unique place because it was colonized and the experience of this, uh, uh, this, this uh, colonial uh, situation, it cannot be, you know, uh, globalized, it, it, it cannot be kind of uh, say that it is applicable to elsewhere because uh, given the kind of specificities of this region and specific historical uh, experiment of South Asian uh, colonialism. At the same time, it has, uh, it, it has much more relevance beyond that because the colonial enterprise worked almost similar way in, in other places in terms of its uh, engagement between, uh, between knowledge and, and, and power. So, uh, historiography and the discipline of history centered in the West in its insights can be neither limited to South Asia nor globalized. So, trafficking between the two and originating as an ambivalent colonial aftermath, subaltern studies demands that its own translation also occurs between these two lines. So, uh, this is a, you know, as I mentioned, this is a uh, uh, summary or, or a review essay by Gyan Prakash. Very, uh, you know, secondly, he has uh, 
you know talked about the theoretical uh, assumptions and methodological orientations of uh, subaltern studies so now uh, we will have two uh, sessions two classes uh, to look at the kind of a criticisms that are raised against uh, subaltern studies so we will do that in the coming class i am winding up the class thank you